Good afternoon. Today I want to share with you some recent research on a little studied aspect of Ottoman architecture that I have called Sinan screens, Ahjari Mushebeke. Since these screens are a characteristic feature of the imperial commissions of Sinan, the great architect, born in 1490 and died in 1588, which places him as contemporary to the European Renaissance in the middle of the 16th century. His career spanned the tenure of four Ottoman sultans, and his work as chief architect spanned five decades. He credits himself with the design of many hundreds of architectural monuments, of which I've been privileged to visit many of those that remain standing in Istanbul, Edirne, and elsewhere, thanks in part to last year's workshop on geometry. Sinan is best known for his genius in combining architecture and engineering to open up interior spaces by creatively utilizing piers, columns, and arches to support a succession of domes and half domes. His work as chief architect included grand imperial commissions which transformed the landscape of Istanbul that had become capital of the Ottoman Empire after its conquest from the Byzantines in 1453. As chief architect, he was responsible not only for the design and oversight of construction throughout the Ottoman Empire, but also for the training of the core of royal architects in what was called the science of geometry, Ilm al Handasa. The series of screens that I've located may have served as etude for the training of architects, which took place in the gardens of the Imperial Palace at Topkapi. There, young architects were also trained in the working of Mother of Pearl Inlay, Sedefkar, for advanced training in geometry. Before we look at the screens more closely, a bit of cultural context and visual culture. Sinan's greatest patron was Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled for 46 years and died in 1566. Here, a portrait of Suleiman attributed to an Italian painter. When Suleiman died, he was immediately succeeded by Selim II, who died in 1574. The portraits of Selim, painted by painters at the court, captured the passion for pat pattern in Ottoman art and interior design, in part what later in the West came to be called wallpaper patterns and so influenced European tastes. Selim was succeeded by Murat III, who ruled until he died in 1595, several years after the death of the great architect Sinan in 1588. Great building complexes, Kulia, such as the Imperial Suleimania complex shown here, and the Selimia in Edirne were conceived in their entirety and designed down to every last detail. More modest building complexes were built for viziers and other members of the court, but not always with such extraordinary details at such a high consistent level. As I mentioned, Sinan is best known for his genius combining, architect, uh, combining architecture and engineering to open up interior spaces, creating a particularly characteristic exterior view, an interior space that is both open and light. Sinan was born near Kaiseri in central Anatolia. 
He was the son of a stonemason. He was accepted into the Janissary Corps at a young age and began his training as an apprentice in carpentry. He progressed to engineering, accompanied the Sultan on numerous military campaigns as the Ottoman Empire expanded its territory. And he was accepted into the Corps of Royal Architects where he excelled in many endeavors. He well understood geometry and expressed it in his three-dimensional compositions. The seriousness of his scientific endeavors may be gleaned toward the very end of his career from an imperial degree, decree of 1578 that required the donation of the library from Sinan's Mahale neighborhood on science and geometry to Takyuddin, pride of the, of the astronomers who had just established an astronomical observatory in Galata across the Golden Horn from the Ottoman Imperial Palace at Topkapi. Present in nearly all of Sinan's buildings, with the exception with the exception of public works such as bridges and aqueducts, the screens about which this talk um, is focused comprise a series of architectural panels with pierced openwork, which serve a variety of screening functions in different contexts. Upper level galleries, porches, balconies, minaret balconies, sherefe, windows, and fountains. The open work allows for the passage of light and air. Light and projection of shadows contributes an aesthetic interest, and they offer as well a modicum of privacy. Simple formal elegance precisely matches form to function. Most of the screens are panels of carved marble. Some are of forged iron. The color is the natural stone. The color, nat, the, the color is the natural color of the stone or of the iron. Generally for imperial commissions, the marble selected was of the purest white variety referred to in the Ottoman sources as Mermeri Marmara, which was quarried locally and specifically selected, carefully transported to the location where it was carved using the traditional tools of the stonemason. Brilliant design with a beveled edge adroitly emphasizes the third dimension. The screens are elegant, refined, minimalist and abstract. The effects of sunlight constantly changing throughout the day and in different seasons contribute visual interest to the articulated ambiguities of interior and exterior space mediated by the open work. Byzantine antecedents for the use of screens are evident, for example, in the Theodosius, the obelisk of Theodosius in the Hippodrome. And there are Islamic antecedents, sorry, Islamic antecedents for the use of interlaced polygons and polygonal networks, more of which I'll talk about in my presentation um, in a few days. Contemporary use of screens with polygonal networks in Mughal architecture of India may have a connection to the Ottoman expression, but is yet to be studied. These screens explicitly convey the essence of geometry through points, lines, and planes, here expressed through the vertices, edges, and faces of polygons articulating relationships among intersecting polygons, star polygons, and polygonal networks. 
The Ottoman Turkish word that I have found for these screens is ahcari mushebeke, literally meaning reticulated stones or stone networks. Sinan used this form extensively in the design for his own tomb enclosure located across from the Suleimania complex, the plan of which, as you see here on the upper left, has been compared to a compass. What characterizes all of the screens are the presence of polygons, networks intersecting and intersecting networks. I've identified regular polygons such as triangles, hexagons, dodecagons, and nonagons, less often pentagons and decagons, and we'll come to that. And in particular of interest, I find the dual tessellations evident in several monuments. All of these works have visible or invisible grids of triangular, hexagonal, square, or rectangular um, lattices. All of the illustrated examples are periodic patterns of the plane in which translation, translational symmetry is present. Most exceptional, however, are a series of circular screens in which radial symmetry is primary. These screens occur in a special location of high cultural and religious value on the triangular framing walls of the mimbar or pulpit which is placed at the front of congregational mosques, just to the right of the mihrab, which orients both architecture and worshiper towards Mecca. Mimbar screens reached a pinnacle of virtuosity with the combination of different patterns, including skillful construction of circular compositions with five-fold and ten-fold symmetries, in some cases created to adapted to create patterns of the plane. In one example, this in the Selimye at Edirne, I have identified radial symmetry with five-fold and ten-fold elements, but I think that it may be long-range and global, but not periodic, that is, without translation. In Sinan's last imperial commission, which he considered to be his greatest achievement, the Selimia in Edirne. The work in this circular medallion fits the model of what has been described as quasi-periodic pattern, the diffraction pattern of metal alloys for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2011 to Dan Schechtman. And I've attempted to superimpose the diffraction pattern of the metal alloy with the circular medallion in Edirne. And although I haven't achieved exact superposition, partly because the photograph of, that I took in Edirne is not um, geometrically precise because of my position, I'm quite convinced that there's a relationship here. Now what's especially interesting is that the earliest development mentioned earlier today in European study of these materials, that is pentagons and decagons, um, as well as a larger polygonal systematic study, was published by Kepler 50 years after these monuments uh, were completed or were worked on by Sinan. And what I suggest is that there is a very systematic study of polygons, intersections, and intersecting polygonal networks evident in the monuments of the great architect Sinan well before the appearance of the published studies of polygons in Europe. Thank you. I think there's time for discussion, and I'm hoping for questions. You said, you said, uh, excuse me, you said a Turkish word for the pattern, interlacing pattern. What was the Turkish word? I couldn't understand. You know, uh, it, let me explain where I got it from. The, the term that I used is ahjar, which is the Arabic plural of hajar, stone, so stones, ahjar. Yeah. 
And then the Persian Ezafe, which is adopted into Ottoman Turkish, Ahjare, Mushebbeke. So networked or latticed or reticulated stones. And that term appears in the Resalia Mimaria of Jafer Effendi, who was writing the biography of Mehmet A, who was a student of Sinan's. Mehmet A. Sedefkar. He was a student of Sinan's in the Royal Corps of Architects. He was, I think, the third successor to Sinan after Davud A. and um, another student. And he um, was involved in the construction, I think it was of Yeni Jami, or maybe it was um, Sultan Ahmed. But Mehmet A. was a student of Sinan, trained by him in geometry, known for his work in um, Mother of Pearl, Sedef Kar, and he, the Resale mentions Ahjari Mushebeke in relation to Sinan's construction of an elementary school in his mahale um, near where his tomb is located. And I thought that that term correlated exactly with these screens, but I have not seen it so identified in publications elsewhere. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I haven't heard the word before in Turkish, that's why I wonder. Well, it's coming from a 17th century Ottoman source. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Hussein Shen mentioned to me that the term he had heard was mafjar mushebike, and that came from a secondary source talking about the Mughal uh, use of these screens. And my own sense, because Ahjari Mushebeke correlates so precisely to the combination of Persian, Arabic, and Turkish that characterized so much of the um, technical vocabulary in the Ottoman, um, uh, Ottoman court, that the Indian expression mafjar mushebeke may be a corruption that relates to a, a different usage somewhat later. And I had not heard of it, and it's a secondary, not a primary source. So. Osmanlı e, mimari eserlerinde e, maalesef terminoloji konusunda sıkıntı var. Ve ben önce sizi tebrik edeceğim. Çünkü bu o, terminolojide zaten var olan bir şey siz ortaya çıkardınız. Ahcar müşebbeke çok doğru bir tanımlama. Bence de üzerinde düşündüm biraz. Çünkü müşebbek zaten oyma demek. Bunu hem cilt sanatında görüyoruz. E, oymalı olan, e, derinliği olan e, sanatta. Bu niye taşta kullanılmasın? Evet taşın oyularak yapılmış hali de ahcar müşebbekedir. Ee, Risale-i Mimariye'den aldığınızı söylediniz. <gülüyor> Niçin Risale-i Mimariye'nin e, basımını yapanlar arkasına e, bu tarz terminolojileri e, koymuyorlar ya da sanat tarihçileri niçin bunu e, gün yüzüne çıkaramadı? E, o da evet e, tartışılması gereken bir konu ve bunun gibi daha birçok terminolojiye kazandırılması gereken hatta yanlış kazandırılmış e, terimler de var. E, ben e, ufakta bir Katkıda bulunmak istiyorum. Konuya birazcık hakim olduğum için bir sınıflandırma yapmak gerekir. Siz çok güzel sundunuz zaten. Osmanlı klasik dönem dediğimiz Mimar Sinan camilerinde bu ahcar müşebbekeler aslında bir sisteme bağlanmış. Sadece beşgen kurguyu minberlerin orta kısmında görüyoruz. Evet, ahşap kapılarda çok var ama minberlerin orta kısmında o da Selimiye Cami, Süleymaniye Cami hariç Süleymaniye Cami'nin orta kısmında minberin orta kısmı desensiz. Onun dışında korkuluk diyeceğimiz minber korkulukları, pencere şebekeleri, galeri korkulukları, hepsi hemen hemen aynı düzene ve altıgen kurguya sahip diye bir ekleme yapacağım. Sadece ekleme değil bu, belki toparlama. <gülüyor> Thank you. First let me say Serap always reminds me how insufficient my Turkish is. <gülüyor> Thank you Serap. <gülüyor>
Um, the, the first comment regarding the vocabulary. Uh, pardon, pardon. Yeah. Um, yetersiz uh, değil. Yetersiz değil. Ben uh, çok memnun kaldım. Sadece uh, konuya... Uh, biraz daha anlaşılır bir boyut kazandırmak istedim. Yoksa çok güzeldi. Her şey çok güzeldi. Teşekkür ederim. Yes, but, but I need a much more sophisticated vocabulary to understand your question in Turkish. So I apologize that I both listened in English and will respond in English. Um, the Risale Mimariye is really an interesting example of, I think, good modern scholarship. Because not only is it published in English as a translation, but it's also published with a modern Turkish transcription of the Ottoman text, which is published in facsimile. So the beauty of this, the, the difficulty is it makes a thick book that's expensive to buy. I don't even have it in my library, which is otherwise huge. So I use the library edition. But it enables me to read the English and then check the modern Turkish, which I can read, and then check the Ottoman facsimile edition, which I can struggle through because it has Arabic script. And so even though I can't read Ottoman, I can make out the words and recognize, oh yes, that is Ahcari Mushebeke. And that does correspond to what's written in the, the modern Turkish script. Um, in terms of a vocabulary or a glossary, you're absolutely right, this should be much more often included in published works. In the Risale, what's interesting is Jafer, uh, uh, Jafer Efendi wrote glossary after glossary after glossary, the page after page after page, explaining all of the 17th century technical vocabulary for architecture and construction. And he gives not only the word and its meaning, but he says, and this is what it's called in Turkish, and this is what it's called in Persian, and this is what it's called in Arabic. So this volume, this edition, is an amazing volume for any of you who are interested in the historical authenticity of the works that we're looking at. In terms of your question concerning classification, this is exactly what's needed in terms of the advance of scholarship. There is not yet the kind of classificatory system that you are describing. When Abdullah Quran first studied Islamic architecture, uh, Ottoman architecture. He classified it according to stylistic developments and identified an early period of Sinan, a classical period, a mature period of Sinan's work. And that has come under more and more scrutiny by historians of Islamic architecture. We now need the kind of system of classification that you are describing, particularly with reference to geometric pattern. And it's geometric pattern in two dimensions and structure in three dimensions. And one of the speculations that I have is that um, the system of proportion and design in the plan of the monuments that corresponds to the main dome and the half domes and the quarter domes, or the squinches if it's a small mosque like um, Shemshi Ahmed Pasha in Üsküdar, which just has one dome and four squinches, whether there's a correlation between the geometry in plan to his choice of intersecting polygons in the screens of each monument. And that's just a big open question. It's one of many questions that I have. But your work is going to be very, very important as this field develops and advances. I hope I've answered the questions that you raised. I may have left one out. If so, remind me. Thank you.